All right, welcome to uh, a board work session. Uh, for public uh, information, the board did meet in executive session today, September 5th, 2017, from roughly 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. to discuss matters of negotiations and personnel. So, what is on the agenda tonight for your guys? We do have a technology update <coughs> plan, Kristen Lentz, and she can introduce her team. Great, thank you very much. Well, I brought two very important people with me here this evening who are going to help us uh, with our presentation. I have Mr. Brett Baker, who I know many of you probably have seen yeah. before. He's our e-learning coach for elementary and uh, new last year, Mr. Mike Bodai, who's our e-learning coach for secondary. And I have to say, this initiative would not be as successful as it is if these two gentlemen weren't working as hard as they do. So I uh, appreciate very much all that they do. This evening, we're going to do a couple quick things to help you understand how we've moved forward in year one and what we're looking forward to in year two. And so some of the information you're going to see presented right now um, will be real time. And then we're also going to have some information happening in the background, which we'll show you later, which showcases a tool called Go Guardian, which our teachers are using in the classroom to help uh, monitor the students um, as we work through our digital learning initiative. One thing I do want to make sure that you understand, we do not typically run this in the evening. It is only run during school hours. We did have to turn it on this evening so we could show you live how it actually works. Um, but our teachers are not able to do any kind of monitoring in the evening. So if you'd like to, you can move your mouse um, or press your space bar, and you should be able to um, see the presentation that's up on the screen. And I'm using a tool called Nearpod that our teachers, some of the, our teachers piloted this tool last year. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of this tool is it allows the teacher to create multiple different kinds of presentations. So like I am doing right now, I can do a directed presentation where when I flip to the next screen, all of your screens should be flipping to the next screen as well. All right, the first part worked, good. Um, so what we really want to talk to you about tonight is, because of digital learning, what kinds of things are we able to do in our classrooms? And if you remember last year, for those of you who um, were here as we began talking about this initiative and even the year before, one of the things that we really felt was important to focus on was the ISTE standards for students. So you can see over the years, those standards have changed and really right now are in line with the focus that we have in North Penn School District, which is transformative learning with technology. And ISTE, by the way, is International Society of Technology uh, Educators, and that really is an international society. People from all over the world contribute um, to creating these standards. So there are seven standards for students, and to help you understand what they are, we are bringing the students to you this evening. Now this part will not be showing uh, on your device, but I do need to say that um, these videos are very recent as of today, what our <laughs> students are doing with Chromebooks. So uh, great job to Brett and Mike for bringing this to us. I am a digital learner. Digital, I am a digital citizen. I understand the rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of living, learning, and working in an interconnected digital world. I am a digital age learner. A communicator. I communicate effectively and express myself creatively using different tools, styles, formats, and digital media. I am a digital age learner. I am a knowledge constructor. I critically select, evaluate, and synthesize digital resources into a collection that reflects my learning and builds my knowledge. I am a digital age learner. I am an empowered learner. I use technology to set goals, work toward achieving them, and demonstrate my learning. global collaborator. I strive to broaden my perspective, understand others, and work effectively in teams using digital tools. I am a digital age learner. I am an in innovative designer. I solve problems by creating new and ima imaginative solutions using a variety of digital tools. I 
am a digital age learner. I am a computational thinker. I identify authentic problems, work with data, and use a step-by-step process to automate solutions. We are Well, hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea about what digital learning is and what those ISTE standards are. Oops. Um, so this screen that you're seeing right now, you can't see it all, is anonymous, but these are all of the Chromebooks uh, and currently what is loading on those Chromebooks. So you, you all have the same thing on there right now. Um, but you'll see in a, in a few minutes how um, we can take a look at different pieces. Now I'm looking for my Nearpod mic, help me out. Oh, there it is, there it is, okay. So one of the things to, that I wanted you to think about as we were doing our update today is that by the year 2025, which sounds <coughs> maybe far away, but to some of us, 2018 probably sounded pretty far away too. I know it did for me because my son was born in 2000 and now he's a high school senior. Um, so the high school seniors in this district of 2025 will have, have equity of access to technology with our initiative and all that we're doing with curriculum, um, for their entire learning career. So when you think about that, that's really different than probably what most of I, us had in our learning careers. One of the things that was really exciting for us at the end of last year, we were asked by Google to become a reference district. Uh, and you may have read some information about this, but there are only 160 Google reference districts in the world. So we feel very honored by that. You actually have to be um, asked to to write a proposal, and our proposal really focused on how we're moving this initiative forward, supported by technology and the funding, but also through the curriculum connections and the professional development that makes it happen for teachers. So um, it was a big team effort to get our application approved. The curriculum department worked very closely with us as, long, as well as our tech team and our administrators. And um, as a result of that, we have a lot of opportunities to pilot test new things for Google. They ask for our feedback. Um, we're asked to be involved in a lot of different things. And we are also um, able to share our story with other districts who are looking to do something similar. So some of you may remember from last year in our, uh, in our three year plan, last year was year one, we were focusing on one-to-one -one technology in grades six to nine. However, the realignment of technology in those younger grades really provided us with an opportunity for all of our students in grades two through nine and Northbridge school to have one-to-one -one technology. In addition to that, one of the most important pieces that we were funding was the increase in infrastructure. Uh, and that's something that's built in every year, so our bandwidth is increasing. We now have access points in every single one of our classrooms that will be using one-to-one -one technology um, and even the potential in those areas where we don't. So over 120, no, I'm sorry, 1,200 access points throughout our district, which is a lot of access points when you think about it. Um, the other piece that was really important to our initiative last year and this year was our professional development. So last year we had something called the, the Kiker Teacher Leaders Program. So Rich Kiker is a consultant for Google and he came out and he worked with many of our teacher leaders about integrating technology in the classroom in addition to Brett and Mike's work um, so that we could spread that teacher leadership across all of our buildings. That is gonna be continuing this year um, but we are also focusing more heavily on a framework that we were discussing last year at a very high level called SAMR. And we're going to talk just about uh, a little bit more about that in just a minute. Chris, so I'm going to jump in for a minute and talk about Kiker Learning. With our Kiker Learning group, we had representatives from every grade level and every school at Kiker Learning. So that was not only last year, but also this year. So there's two members from every team, every school team here to take back the knowledge to their building. This year we were a little bit more intentional with the people that we chose. Last year we were looking for people that were just interested in technology and we felt could, we could move them up the, up the scale. Um, this year we were a little bit more intentional with people who are going to be more ambassador types and they're gonna carry the messages forward in a more, um, in, a, in a broader fashion, so. That's Kiker learning both last year and this year. Sorry, Kristen, go ahead. <laughs> That's fine. 
So um, thanks to our high school, all of our technology personnel, many of the other personnel support staff. This year we have just about completed distribution of all of our Chromebooks uh, in grades 6, 11, and 12, which completes our initiative now in year two to be fully one-to-one, -one, two through 12. Um, so that's a big undertaking and um, a lot of support that goes on with that. But rollout went really well. The high school team did a great job of getting all those Chromebooks in the hands of students. And we are at almost 15, per, only 15% of our parents who um, are still working on getting their fee paid. So that's pretty incredible when you think about over 7,000 devices and payments. So one of the other things that we're gonna be looking at this year is what are we gonna do for K and one and second grade? Second grade currently has iPads, uh, but a lot of our second grade teachers are saying we really want Chromebooks because we're using Google Classroom and we're using all these Google tools and the kids understand it. Um, so we are gonna be doing some pilots in second grade to look at that technology. Um, and if it fits in second grade, and then also what makes sense for KM1. You know, we know literacy is such a critical component of those years, so we want to make sure that we select a tool that supports what they're doing in, in those grade levels as well. We actually started that Chromebook in second grade at the very end of last year, so we outfitted uh, four classrooms with Chromebooks at the second grade level at the end of last year, so they had about three weeks to work with the Chromebooks and their students. Uh, for the teachers and for the students, it was kind of, it was more fun being able to try something new at the very end of the year when, when normally that instructional piece is dropping off and you're trying to keep the interest of the students. In these particular classes, it went the other way. When they got the Chromebooks, it was like a new year. It was like a new awakening. And it, so we had a lot of positive response from the Chromebooks just last year. And this year, those same teachers were able to hit the ground running. And on the first day, uh, all four of those second grade classrooms were using their Chromebooks on the first day of school. So that's, that's an incredible that's an incredible look at the second grade. One of the other things that we are planning to do currently for 1819 is to use uh, the Chromebook technology that will be in 11th and 12th grade to move that down as those students graduate to the younger grades. We do have technology there, but it's a little bit older. So as part of our refresh cycle, we won't need to invest in new technology. We'll be using those Chromebooks um, at those lower grade levels. And then also planning for increased infrastructure, getting to 10 gig. Um, as you see, that video that Mike and Brett put together in what, two hours um, plus the time to go to the buildings, our students are doing that same type of thing. So the amount of video and the bandwidth um, that is required to do those kinds of activities in the classroom continues to increase. So one statistic that I would like to show you, this one is a little more of a basic <laughs> statistic, but it's one of the statistics that we look at in terms of progress. I apologize uh, that it's small, but this one is from August. And if you look right here at the spike, August 7th, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but Mr. Baker, what was happening August 7th that you think may be caused that spike of use? I believe that spike was caused by our initial distribution in 11th and 12th grade. Yes. So August 7th was our first day of distribution, and I think it's really cool to be able to see the usage of Google Classroom and some of these other Google tools immediately increased um, on those days that we were doing distribution. Um, decreased a little bit as the, that was actually a week we weren't doing it, distribution, and then the, the 22nd we started the distribution again. So one of the things that we had our students do is to join a Google Classroom and to complete a digital citizenship activity as part of the distribution process. So we didn't just give them a Chromebook, we had them complete some questions, think about their responsibility as a digital citizen, think about what does it mean to have a safe password and not share it, what are my Chromebook guidelines, how should I be taking care of my device. Um, and we can t we're gonna continue to do that this year um, through those Google Classrooms for students. During distribution, it's not just it's not just handing them the Chromebook and doing that one activity. We had stations where once they got the Chromebook, they went to a station and they actually went through a little tutorial with uh, either a tech assistant or Mike or me. Uh, somebody took them through just some of the basics of the Chromebook, and then there's also video tutorials that we prepared. So they're put in they're embedded in the Google Classroom that they join. So once they're in the Google Classroom, 
they do that activity for digital citizenship, and then when they get home, they can actually watch a series of videos to give them the ins and outs of the Chromebook, since the Chromebook is a little different than the laptops that many of them are used to using. So that worked out really, really quite well for us. So one of the things we're moving forward with this year are tools like Nearpod that allow us to not only um, show a presentation to all of our students on their screen, so instead of having every student just looking at one screen, um, but the interactive piece and the data collection behind these tools can be really powerful for teachers when they're doing assessment in the classroom. So we're going to do some quick quiz questions here with you. Um, nothing too hard. And I'm going to scroll forward here. So here's the first one. So you're going to see my screen as a teacher. You're seeing the screen as a student. And since the beginning of last year, we want you to guess how many Google Docs have we created in our school district. So I know the numbers are sort of hard there. But when you're ready, just put your number in it. And what you can see is as students respond, again, it's all anonymous. Nobody knows what, what number anybody is. Um, the teacher can see the data. Uh, and then can share it out with students if depending on what question is if it's appropriate. Please lock in your answers now. <laughs> I guess election hit send. Yeah. yeah. So this was created as a poll. There is no right answer or wrong answer on the board, and that promotes the discussion. They can also be put in, as uh, Dr. Landis said, as a quiz question, which would indicate, yes, you got the answer incorrect, or yes, you got the answer correct. And then that provides rapid, rapid feedback for the student if they were working independently. As a group discussion, though, ours, I would just say there were 858 thousand Google Docs created. So those of you who said B, you're right on the money because that's how many docs we created really in one year uh, of our initiative. And actually, um, and we, we track the data every six months and look at growth. And I believe we continue to have about 100% growth in the Google Docs and slides that are created in our domain. So we did. So we did uh, the Bright Bite survey, which uh, last year wasn't the first year we used the Bright Bite survey. I believe it was the third time we used Bright Bites, and uh, I think it was three times. And that's for administrator, staff, and students. And it just ta it's a barometer to see where they sit as far as using technology in the classroom. And so, Kristen, you can go to the next slide. In our Bright Bite survey, what percentage of our students reported using collaborative tools? So once again, you can see it, it's in the form of a poll, and you're not going to get told, yeah, you got the wrong answer. Uh, but it's more of a discussion question. All right, I'm going on right now. And as a matter of fact, I would have loved it to have been 94%, but it was actually 76%, which uh, we're actually very proud of the 76%. Um, if you look across the entire district, 76%, it's, it's a good solid number of collaboration happening. So Kristen, next slide. In the area of coaching, which that would be Mike and myself uh, for the technology end. How many teachers out of 953 feel they have gotten instructional tech planning assistance within one week of request? If I were using this in a teaching setting, I would read the answers just for our learners that uh, needed a little assistance with those numbers. And then I would refer back to that 953, which is the number of uh, teaching staff we have. I can see that uh, the answers are all over the board. Uh, once again, I would love the answer to have been A, 910. But unfortunately, it was 620, which is about 66% of the teachers out there. And once again, I would spin a positive on that and say, not everyone had the opportunity to use instructional technology last year. And those who did, um, we, we met 
we met the needs of about 600 of them. I think the other thing to note about that, though, is um, new last year was our technology support specialist team. Um, so they are sort of the mini coaches for Brett and Mike, deal more with the skill development, uh, where Brett and Mike are dealing more with the pedagogy and the curriculum piece. And so I think some of our teachers, when they think of coaching, they're, they're truly thinking of Brett and Mike. Um, and I would venture to guess that we really are meet, reaching more teachers than that. Um, on a weekly basis because those tech support specialists h hardly have time to meet with me because um, they're out in building, they're meeting with teachers and groups and at faculty meetings. So they're, they are really not spending time idle wondering what they should do with their time. Uh, and I think that's really going to grow even more this year as we take a look at uh, the SAMR model. So in 120 seconds, I know you might uh, have a little bit of knowledge about SAMR, but here's a real quick review about what SAMR means, why are we even talking about it, and why it's so important in our initiative. 20 seconds. The SAMR model is a framework that provides a lens for viewing technology integration in the classroom. The first level is substitution, or the idea that a block is a block no matter where it is or how you access it. This would be like using Google Docs as any other word processor. The new tech replaces the old tech, but it does not change the task. The next level is augmentation. At this level, the tech is still a substitute, but provides more functionality as students work to complete the same task. The ability to share your Google Doc in one click and the fact that it saves to the cloud automatically and provides you access from anywhere is an increase in functionality. The next level is modification. Here the ball really gets rolling because the technology is used to redesign parts of the task and transform student learning. Students collaborating on one Google Doc and using the comment feature to provide instant feedback is an example of modification. The final level of SAMR is redefinition. At this level, we're able to design and create new tasks that were once unimaginable. By shifting our perspective from technology just being another block or substitute, we're able to truly start imagining the possibilities. An example of redefinition would be connecting to a classroom across the world through students sharing Google Docs. They would each write their own narrative of the same historical event, using the chat and comment section to discuss the differences, then students would use the Voice Comments app to discuss the differences they noticed and embed this in their class website as a culture walk. To recap, substitution is the same task, new tech replaces old tech. Augmentation is the same task, but the tech increases functionality. Modification, we're able to redesign parts of the task. Redefinition, we're able to create new tasks once unimaginable. As we move from substitution to redefinition, we're moving from enhancing to transforming student learning. So one final question um, for our participants here would be to just think about, after you watch that video, what's one word that comes to your mind in regards to this technology model? Doesn't have to be a fancy word. Um, So one of the things that you'll notice as you're um, thinking and responding, as the teacher, again, I can see all of the students' responses. If their names were in there, I could see their names right here. But one thing I could do, I could also do, is if I have a student that has an answer that I would want to share back, if I click the share button, I believe that should now show on everybody's screen. It does. All right. Um, so what, that's. Not only can they do words, but they can do pictures, they could do drawings uh, and share them back. They could be solving math problems and sharing those types of things back. So there are lots of ways. A tool like this can, is more interactive than just teachers you know, sharing a presentation with all of those student screens. So Kristen, this is one of the areas where we're moving from using smart boards for direct teaching in front of the class to making it more of a personalized learning environment. So we're taking the learning from the screen up front and really moving it in front of the student. So th that's another thing that we have to, that's a, a huge paradigm shift for our teachers because for years they're working without smart boards. Then we, 
put them in a classroom with an interactive board and say, hey, bring the students up and they can help participate in that lesson. And then what happens now is we're saying, wait, 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 that's not best practice because you could have every one of those students involved in your lesson and not just that one that's coming to the board. So as Mike and I are out there, that's one of the, that's one of the pieces that we really emphasize is that paradigm shift that has, that has to happen in our brains to allow students to be doing their personalized work right here at their device. One of the other things that's also really important to us as we look at tools to use in this initiative, obviously, is cost effectiveness and functionality with Google. So since that is our primarily pla primary platform, we want to make sure that any tools that we choose are really easily um, used with the Google Classroom and the Google suite of tools. So how are we going to get our teachers to move through that SAMR level from the substitution to the redefinition? Well, we've um, set device use goals for our teachers every year. and um, this is a spreadsheet, I, um, you can take a look more deeply at it later, I know it's kind of small there. But we've set it into trimesters for our teachers and said to them, you need to think about the different ways you're using technology in your classroom. This is an example of second through six because they're on trimesters. Um, and in trimester one, we want to see you uh, showing us two examples of substitution. Now obviously teachers are probably doing a lot more than that in their classroom. Uh, but the, the conversation with our administration will be that thoughtful process of why is that substitution, why does that make sense? Because certainly there are times when using technology in that substitution way can be really helpful. So something we might have had students uh, doing on a worksheet, if they're doing it in Google Classroom, all the students can turn it back into the teacher, the teacher can share feedback right away. So there is an enhancement even though it's uh, you know, kind of categorized as a substitution piece. Um, so those levels of substitution and augmentation aren't necessarily bad. Um, they're, they're allowing us to engage students in different ways with the technology. So as we work through the year, we're going to ask them to, by the end of the year to be submitting those redefinition modification examples, which take more time to create. Um, so that's really where our tech team will be focusing this year. Um, one other piece I just wanted to show you with that is we will be having a Google Classroom for all of our teachers. So in modeling the use of this tool, we want our teachers to use Google Classroom with their students. Um, we're going to be using it. I'll be co-teaching with all of the principals of Google Classroom where teachers will be able to submit their artifacts. So you can see here, this is just a quick example of what it would look like if uh, we have nine students in here. Nobody's done the assignments yet. Um, but we can also have resources in there for them. So that video that I showed you, we have a whole about section that we are providing for our teachers. If they want to watch a video, if they want to read about SAMR, if they want to take a look at some example lessons using SAMR. So we have lots of resources that we are pushing back out um, to share with them so that they have the opportunity to learn in the way that works best for them. Um, one other piece that I did want to mention about our parent connection piece, we got a new filter this year and it was more cost effective than our other filter. It's all cloud based so it's a lot easier to manage and it also has a parent report feature built in and so I don't know if you have any friends in the district but if you do who are in the Chromebook initiative they're going to be seeing something like this where anything, any off-campus activity, parents will get this report mailed to them weekly. If there's no activity, they won't get a report. And so in this particular example, you can see there aren't, some, there aren't activities in certain areas. Um, but parents were really excited about this. Kids, not so much. Um, you know, they're still filtered off of our campus, just like they would be when they're at school. Um, but parents will uh, be able to see some of the activities that their students are doing. I know we had some parents wondering last year if they could see a little bit more about what their students are doing if they're home and the parents aren't home. You know, they certainly want to promote the use of technology, but they want to make sure that they're not abusing it as well. Um, so we've gotten some positive feedback to that this year. Um, so I know that was a really quick overview. Um, we want to wrap up with the um, GoGuardian demonstration. So we took a little bit of a look at that um, when I showed you the screens. Here we go. I'm going to go back to that. So you can see here, this is my live view of GoGuardian. Um, and I know I don't have any students off task right now, but if I did, I could actually see that. Oh, do I have, is this Brett? Yeah. Are you off task, Brett? Okay, so you can see this is Brett's screen right here. 
And on, if I click on Brett's screen, as a teacher, I can see he's got, oh, how to be a supervillain. So he was on a couple other websites while I was doing the presentation. <laughs> Brett. Um, it's so, an author, James Patterson. Okay. Um, <laughs> So what's really nice about this is we have the real-time data that you're seeing right now. Um, and, but the other really nice piece is when I end the session, which I'm going to do right now, um, as a teacher, I can say how it went. I'm going to say it went great. Um, and hopefully in just a minute, I'm going to get an email. Every single day I get an email when my session has ended for my students. Um, and it will tell me a couple things about what was going on in my classroom. So one of the ways, as our teachers get more comfortable using the technology, we're helping teachers use this tool is for a more personalized learning approach. So let's say I have my student in gr students in groups, and obviously I realize you know, I'm going to have to monitor Brett Baker more closely because he's off task, whether if he's in a group um, or, or whatever. So I'll be able to see that data. and. Mike, I don't know, but let's see if it came into my email box, which I apologize is like super large. Oh, here it is. Is this it? No? It might not be in there yet. I did. There it is. Oh, here right it is. top. Okay. So here, here comes a session summary. Um, and this is a really neat piece. It tells me how long my session was, who was the teacher, um, and what was happening in my classroom. So now, obviously, I don't have a lot of different data in here. So my students were pretty much on task in their Google Classroom or they were in Nearpod. Uh, but if I had a lot of different websites the students were going to, I'd see those in that area, that pie chart right there. Um, I also see some data about my students. So um, who was browsing the most, um, who, who spent the least time on all my sites. Um, again, we, you know, we were pretty much all doing the same thing. But as we um, create more diversity in our classrooms, we definitely see different students' names pop up here that maybe we didn't see in class, but then we can go up and follow up on uh, at a later time. One of the things that GoGuardian allows you to do is, if the students are off task, without calling them out, you can just shut down the place where they're browsing right now, and so the site would shut down and they would be really sent back to where where we were doing our teaching or where they should have been, which was in a Google Doc or in Google Classroom or wherever the teacher had them, uh, had designed for them to go. And GoGuardian would allow you just to redirect that student without calling them out and saying, Ed, what are you doing across the room? Um, I can just have a private conversation with Ed if I need to and say, could you head back to Google Classroom? And I could shut down the site where he was hanging out. All right, so that concludes our presentation. Hopefully it gave you a good snapshot of where we are in year two. Um, we are really excited. It was great to see um, the excitement at the high school uh, with the initiative, and I can share we had one teacher, second day of school, using a program called Flipgrid in an algebra classroom to have his students talk about why integers are important in math. So day two, we were already changing what's happening in the classroom. So um, thank you to you for all of your support of that. Um, and I also want to mention thanks uh, to Acer, who is the company um, that we have chosen for our Chromebooks. They um, sponsored cases for all of our students um, who have waiver requests so that their, their cases will be protected. So they've really done a lot to help support us in this initiative as well. Any questions? Thank you. I have one question, if you don't mind. No, no. Um, are, are you finding that most of the teachers are um, proficient in using this program? And um, what happens when they're not? Well, we have a lot of supports in place for them. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but we did look at it today. I think it went from 26% to potentially 75% of our teachers within one year saying that they understand uh, basic functionality of the tools that we're using. So that's, again, through the Bright, Bright Bites data. Um, so where we are seeing those deficiencies, we're working with principals, and we have Brett and Mike and the tech support team out um, meeting with those teachers and providing additional staff development for them. And one more question, if sure. I may. So 
um, at the high school level out of a 35 or 40 minute class. Are these being used for the whole 40 minutes or how is it broken down into instructional time? I'll let you guys answer. Mike, do you want to answer or should I just take it? So with the high school, with the high school teachers, really this, we're about seven days into it for the high school. So for us to give you a, a good definitive answer at the high school, that would be very difficult. Um, I can say in the elementary and middle school, they're definitely not being used from sun up till sundown. There's a good, right now, there's a good mix. And so I would say, there's teachers that are proficient, there's teachers that are advanced, and there are certainly teachers that are basic. And so the use of technology varies not only with the student and the subject matter, but also with the teacher and their comfort level with the technology. And that's just the reality. But to say that we're 100% and everybody's out there using it full speed ahead, we have all different levels of learners in teaching staff as we do in our student staff, our, in our student ranks. And if you remember, when we, when we implemented, Kristen you know, really said, the goal is not to have kids on computers all day, every day. So it's, it's uh, use as makes sense in the classroom. I think one comfort, though, I would share for the high school staff, you know, different than when we implemented in year one, is that our 10th graders are coming all knowing how to use Google Classroom. So last year, it was everybody was really getting into Google whether or not they had a Chromebook, some use the year before, um, but all of our teachers are seeing more knowledge from students about how to use these tools. Uh, so I think that they feel more comfortable trying things in the classroom because they know they're not going to have to teach students how to do everything. In our younger classrooms, you know, our teachers are still investing some time with students, but at those older grades, I know even our, we have amazing gym teachers at the high school who are doing some really neat things with health and Google Classroom, um, and they just couldn't wait till all their students were coming with the knowledge of how to get into the classroom and do things so they didn't have to spend instructional time teaching that. But it is really important for us that it's a balance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you stick around in case somebody from the audience might have a question for you? Absolutely. All right, uh, I'm going to take public comment. Anybody wishing to offer us public comment, please step forward, state your name and address. Good evening, uh, my name is William Patchell. I live at 404 Bonnie Lane in Langdale, actually Montgomery Township. We use their post office. And uh, a commentary about the use of technology. It's a very deceptive thing to place all your responsibility in the hands of a technologist. And I know that it has, it's a siren song and I guess Ulysses would have run himself aground had he involved technology, and it was very difficult not to, not to listen to the siren song. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is, firstly, there's way too much reliance on, I don't like Google, I don't like Facebook, I don't like any of these things because it's creating the homogenization of our society. Yeah, when we've got three people delivering things, I've got my UPS man, i got people next door, I think they, they look at it, might be even getting a little reclusive. They never leave their house. The man brings stuff to the, and I said, pretty soon, now they'll be getting their food, and this all seems pretty wonderful. But then on the other time, I hear ominous reports of, gee, on the USS McCann, what happened? Situational awareness, um, instability on the bridge. Now, I'm sure that Lockheed Martin and Raytheon has just packed that bridge with all kinds of technology, and I'm sure that the DOD did extensive research on all the fabulous things that this ship could be doing. Well, what happened? 
wow, we had a collision? How did that happen? I would hate to think that North Penn School District would be sold a bill of goods by the technology people. Oh, that, didn't, that didn't work out. We, we had unforeseen problems. And then we had the McCann. We had the Fitzgerald. We've had numerous accidents. How could this have happened? So the reply for the Department of the Navy, they're very slow on giving us real, they, they just can everybody that was like on the bridge. And, but we still haven't got a good, a good explanation on, gee, how, to, how does a warship with the finest electronic equipment get rammed dead side? The last time I saw anything on that scale was a Roman trireming knocking the heck out of a Greek, a Greek vessel. So, you know, I'm a little leery about technology. You know what I got? I got, I got an old dumb phone. It's like $10 a month. I don't want to take pictures. I don't want to be reached. What I want to do is I want to call 911 or I want to call the police at Montgomery Township, and it's wonderful. You know why I moved there? Because they come to my house in five minutes, and uh, in two more minutes, if it looks pretty bad, there's a vicious dog with another black and white car. So, you know, technology doesn't do anything for me. A fine example of a police officer showing up at my house that, that's been well-trained is a lot better than that technology. I mean, the car's loaded with technology, man. I don't even know how the guy sits behind the wheel. I mean, he's got screens and this and that. So that's technology. And I'm sure they have this down in Philadelphia, but they have their hands full about, you know, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I worry about human stupidity. Man, that is really, really tough to deal with, you know? And I think that we have enough people. I sit there in a Wendy's. I go out for a coffee. They're very nice to me, a senior citizen. I get the coffee for nothing. And I'm an obs I do my observation, and I'm a uh, spectator of what goes on. These kids come in on skateboards. They look kind of funny. I hope they're able to get a job with a funny earrings and a funny-looking hair and, you know, different colors, you know. You're really good. You have telephonic skills. You know what? You look very odd. I, I would have to keep my eye on you or at least... Uh, uh, I'll hire you on a, on a limited basis from, from an outsourced person, and we'll see how this all works out. So I, I'm going to end, but when you talk about bringing all this technology, technology, gee, that sounds like that would be applicable to, oh, the perfect family. It's Ozzie and Harriet, the husband, the wife. They both have, they have a wonderful house. They're really doing well. They have full medical and everything. Boy, that's really fantastic. But what is the real fact is that America, 50%, probably single families, okay, where are they getting all this stuff? They're getting this stuff. You know what? Some kids, gee, he drives a Mercedes to high school. He's got an iPhone, whatever it is. I think there'll be a thousand dollars a shot pretty soon. Why are you giving kids that can well afford this technology? If you know what, if you're on the free lunch program, I can think about giving you a Chromebook. But I'll tell you what, in a good conservative Republican environment, those that are stakeholders are asked to contribute what they can for the outcome of all. This is not, oh yeah, I got everything for free. It doesn't work like that in a society that we hope to live in. I don't want to live in a society where something comes marching down the highway from DC or Harrisburg. That is not how a republic was built. It was built by the individual effort of each, of each stakeholder. Clear thinking and doing what they think would be best for their life, not this homogenization of, of education or whatever. I don't like where you're going, and I certainly don't want to pay for it. Thank you very much. Phil, you do realize that this increases accountability in the classroom, right? You do understand the collaborativeness of this environment where I can have every student personalized education. There's a wealth of information that you could use and the accountability as a teacher in a classroom. I don't have to worry as the, as we talked about the training module issues, the training, you got people not educated or grown up with this technology and you're gonna have to educate them on how to use it and implement it in a classroom. I'm 57 years old, Bill. I did not grow up with computers, but I'm an instructional technology specialist now because I went to school for it. And I know how to use it in a classroom and I can monitor every kid in my classroom at all times with this kind of software and this kind of power. It's a great tool. It is not a mistake. We have a society that's so empowered that a lot of these states, they're completely incapacitated by an opioid epidemic. And where does that technology lead? 
oh yeah, we just give them out. They don't feel real good, so we'll make them feel good. I don't like it. They're not connected, Bill. They're not a connected issue. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else? I'm Jenna Ott, and I'm Montgomery Township, and I real quick just wanted to check in. I've been obviously talking with quite a few parents over the last few weeks, um, and I know that it was mentioned at the August 14th ECP meeting, it's on the report online, that there was going to be a conversation about the additional information concerning possible kindergarten and early childhood uh, options. I know that was supposed to be presented tonight, and a few of us are waiting on kind of that report, so I just wanted to check in and see if that was going to come up or if that would be coming up in the next couple meetings. Is that something that you guys the, have? Our report in August said that it would come to a future work session. Yes. It actually said this ses session. It said the September. Oh. Well, so that's, that's I just wanted to check right in. Out that I know of. I was pretty sure she said it would be in a future work session. I'm, yeah, that's fine. I'm just checking because it's actually printed on the North Penn School District I work. I agenda. set the agenda for the work sessions for the school board in October and November. We're mm -hmm. gonna t I'm going to talk to Kurt and, and set it up. Okay. So it's coming up in one of the next two months? Well, I'll, I'll talk to Kurt about it, sure. Okay, thank you. Can I just chime in on that because I was at that ECP meeting and and we did we did discuss bringing it forward to to, to the September meeting and it is in the minutes that are posted on our website. That's the ECP committee. That's not what was read right at the board report. And but also the board the report set by the board in the minutes and our policies is set by myself in consultation with the superintendent. You I understand that. that you set that. The committees don't tell the board what to do. The board tells the committees what to do. I I understood that the committees made recommendations to the board. One of our recommendations at that ECP meeting was to bring forward the presentation that was presented twice now to ECP. Um, to the full board at the next work session, and it is in the minutes. I'm just saying that it's well, that's what a great recommendation, but I didn't accept that. You heard the report in, in August, and you know that the agenda set by myself as the president and within consultation of the superintendent. I, I understand the what ECP you're telling me. Tell us what to do. We well, tell the ECP what to do. Right, but your, your policy has always been that ECP, like our committees, make recommendations to our board. Correct, and you 99% of the time, at a work session. right? And at the ECP committee meeting, it was discussed that we bring forward several presentations, several options about um, promoting some kind of uh, enhanced learning for kindergarten. And one of the options is all day kindergarten. One of the options uh, was I, extended I'm well aware kindergarten. Of it. I read the minutes too, but again, I'll say it again: the ECP committee does not dictate the board's agenda. It's the opposite way. The board dictates the subcommittee, the ECP's agenda. The committee uh, doesn't say we're going to put this on the work session for next month. No, it doesn't work that way. But it did. It did say that, and you can argue. You can argue with me. That's okay. I understand. Yeah. Of course. Yes, that's yes. what happened at the last meeting after the report. Well, all right. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm just disagreeing with you, okay? Whatever. Any other comments? Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Lynn Lentz, and I live at 812 Lombardi Drive in Lansdale. Um, and um, first of all, I want to say I was very impressed with the technology presentation. I actually do technology as a daily part of my life. So um, my son actually just got his Chromebook this year, and he's very excited for it. So I'm excited to see the kinds of things um, that are going to happen there. Um, but the reason I came to speak tonight 
um, was to kind of follow up on things that were discussed um, at the last school board meeting. Um, and I'd kind of like to make two points today. First of all, well, I'm very happy that there was a fourth sixth grade class added to Knapp Elementary so that their class size could go from 29, 30 students down to about 20, 22. Um, I believe the process that getting us to that fourth class could have been handled a little bit differently. Um, I appreciate that managing student enrollment uh, and class size with the need to bring on another teacher's salary is a delicate fiscal balance. I, I get that. It's, we're a large school district that's hard to manage. However, what I can't understand is how we cannot make a determination by, say, August 15th that these classes are at the maximum and any new students are going to put us over that limit. So we can proactively add that class now um, so that even with adding that additional student, um, if they don't register before the first day, there are kids that come throughout the year. Adding this fourth class in the middle of August gives principals the time at each school to properly seek out and interview qualified candidates if a new teacher is needed and to assign the children to the right teacher with the right mix of other kids in that class. This also gives the new teacher enough time to prepare for the new classroom, especially with the use of technology now and being able to figure out the best way to use that and, and start their school year off right um, and get the kids going you know, right from the first start. We need time to prepare for that. Um, it also gives, especially in grades fourth, fifth, and sixth grade that we now have team teaching, they need to be able to work together. They need to be able to communicate with the other teachers in that classroom setting and all be on the same page starting the first day of school. Within the last two weeks prior to the start of the school year, I've seen my son's fourth grade teacher, homeroom teacher, change two times, and my son's sixth grade homeroom teacher changed four different times over two weeks. I understand you know, there are challenges, but these switches were not due to any change of personnel, medical issues, or other HR. It was simply due to an increase in student enrollment. And all it took was three students to enroll to cause this to happen. So on the Friday before school's supposed to start on Tuesday, our principal was interviewing a new teacher to fill that new spot. We got a phone call saying that this was done, they hired a teacher, and that they were reshuffling kids around, and we would be notified when our new teacher was assigned. <clears throat> I, again, appreciate the balanced fiscal responsibility that needs to happen, but waiting until the last possible second to hire these teachers has put our students, myself, the other parents at NAP on an emo emotional roller coaster that I think could have been handled differently and avoided altogether. This reshuffling is also taking away the focus of our principals. As I said, when he, she should have been conducting a staff meeting, she was interviewing potential new candidates. This should be a time spent preparing for the start of the school year, not interviewing new teachers. Um, so all I'm asking is that we reevaluate re our policy and approach to determining those numbers of classrooms and making firm decisions earlier in August. So this last minute switching doesn't need to occur. Um, I actually had contacted both Dr. Diedrich and Dr. Santor back in April with a concern of the sixth grade class at Knapp Elementary and was told that enrollment would continue to be monitored. <clears throat> with class size being concerns back in April, what I can't understand is why it took until August 25th, two days before the start of school, that I knew that I received that phone call about the class being added. Uh, I also, would, like I said, the kids were being shifted around. My son had gone through four different teachers in terms of who he was going to have as his homeroom teacher. I get that they see other teachers, but he still didn't know who he was going to see the first day. Um, so I guess more, I just want to make sure that we can have all of our teachers adequately plan for the school year and have that right mix of students so kids aren't switching. These are children that we're shuffling around and not just numbers. So I'd like us to reconsider our timing on when we make these decisions. My second point is just in respect to the current guidelines regarding class sizes. I believe I heard at the last school board meeting that the current guidelines have been in place since 2011. And I know that over the years and even before 2011, various studies have been done evaluating the impact of smaller class sizes on student outcomes, such as the Tennessee STAR experiment. And all those studies have shown that smaller class sizes does have a positive impact on test scores, but it also shows to have a positive impact on life outcomes in years to come after the experiment. So students that were assigned to these smaller classrooms as they continue throughout their careers in school 
those students that were in the smaller classrooms, they were, they were had lower incidence of juvenile criminal behavior, teen pregnancy, high school graduation, college enrollment, completion, and completion, quality of college attending, and savings behavior, et cetera. Um, furthermore, small classes have also shown to have a positive impact on student engagement behaviors in terms of the amount of effort put forth and initiative taken and participation by that student. Furthermore, these studies that were done that show the smaller class sizes also allows teachers to better tailor their instruction. So we are just talking about that personalized, um, you know, being able to tailor instruction more with this technology that can even be done even more if you have a smaller class size and you can really get to know what those students are and what their unique needs are. So to me, this point is even more important in today's classroom now that we've gone through, moved to the model of full inclusion in our elementary schools. We now have a wider range of abilities and special needs of the children in the classroom. So a teacher would be able to more easily implement those differentiated instruction geared to meet the unique needs of those individual students if they're in that smaller class size setting. I am also concerned with the way full inclusion is currently implemented within Nerf Penn. From my understanding, the most effective and successful models of full inclusion call for co-teaching. What that means is you have a dedicated general education teacher and a dedicated special education teacher that both co-teach that classroom throughout the entire day. But from my understanding what's happening right now, this co-teaching is not how it's being executed. Instead, four out of say, two out of say four of the classrooms in a given grade level are considered full inclusion while the other two are normal. So those two classes have a higher portion of students with special needs, and those classrooms also don't have a dedicated co-teacher for the entire day. So instead, throughout the day, teacher aides and special education teachers come into those classrooms when the formal instruction is being done. But then there are other times throughout the day in which the general education teacher has to manage the class on their own. Depending on the demeanor, the demeanor of the students in that class, this puts a lot more stress on those teachers. And not all the teachers put in these classrooms have the special training needed to educate and supervise all these various needs that you have going on in the classroom now. To me, this practice is unfair to those teachers and to all the students in the classroom, whether they have special needs or not. We are going to burn out good teachers if we don't look at how we're executing the practice of full inclusion closely. Again, although studies have been done across the country in terms of smaller class size, I would also like just to consider, and I'd like to know more about any studies that are being done on how it's working within North Penn. So what is the situation at North Penn in terms of class sizes in general, the impact that full inclusion has on those classes? What types of observations are currently being done? And in terms of those observations, not just going in and observing a class for one day, you know, once a month. Let's look at a class for one full week and really see what that dam dynamic looks like and how, how it is impacting the way students are interacting, how the teachers are interacting, and how education is, is being done. I also would recommend conducting an anonymous survey of staff, teachers, and principals, both on class size and the policy of full inclusion. It would be interesting to see for students, for teachers maybe who had a larger class size last year and now do actually have a smaller class size with the addition of some of these teachers, what impact and change they see in how they can interact and connect with the students in their classes. What's working and what's not? This survey I think would need to be done anonymously so staff feel comfortable answering truthfully. The only way we can best improve our approach to education at North Penn is to know the true current state of affairs. <clears throat> and as an instructional designer by profession, I create surveys on a routine basis. So I would even volunteer my time to help develop this survey so we can know what's going on and be able to best implement. Maybe it is working, but from what I'm hearing from some of my kids, some of the times it doesn't work. And I wanna just make sure that the education my kids are getting is what is the best that they can. To close, I appreciate the need to maintain this fiscal responsibility and I understand that Keeping a class size higher means we have a lower number of teacher salaries that need to be paid. But maintaining a budget is not our only responsibility here. We are also responsible for maintaining the integrity of the education of the children will receive. So to that end, I just strongly believe that money would be well spent adding another teacher salary in order to bring that student number down so that we can have a student to teacher ratio that allows our teachers to make better connections with our children. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, Dr. Dietrich, why don't you explain the process of how you went about making the decisions? Because I heard tonight she asked the question, and I think you've already answered before. Sure. You made the decision to not add the additional teacher because all our classes were under our guidelines. That's correct. The juncture she was talking about, at that point in time, the decision would have been not to add another teacher because they were still within the class size guidelines. Uh, after that point, though, there was a time in there when the numbers did come up, and we do try very hard to get uh, individuals to come and register their children, but there are some people that don't do that, and they're late registrants, and that process continues through the month of August. So once those numbers did uh, go over the class size guidelines, then we did add another teacher. So that's the way that worked. As far as uh, her student having four different teachers, I'm not sure I understand that process. Well, that would be down in a little more detail and that the building principal would be better able to answer in terms of how perhaps that person was assigning teachers and where they were, grade level they were putting them at. I don't have that at my fingertips. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, is there anything we need to do with the presentation or is this just an informational update? No, it's just information. Everything's in the works yep. Yep. and you're going to go from there. Uh, I would like to see copies of the... Uh, teacher report that gets sent out and also the, the parent report so I can see the difference I know and and Brett mentioned it that you can click in and get a student back on task I also can click into uh, the software and take over their game if they're playing a game online and I crash them and then then tell them to go back to work but you know I know that that's an important tool for the teacher because as I walk around the room, I can check on three students and then see what everyone else is doing behind my back because I have the, you know, the machine in front of me. Um, so I'd like to see both those reports to see what they say. I'd appreciate that. Motion to move forward and adjourn. So moved.